If you're visiting with us and your children are that age, they are more than welcome to head downstairs and have their own uh, uh, children's worship time. So uh, feel free to let your kids join the others. Well, we are uh, in a series of messages we started a couple weeks ago um, about the commands of Jesus. And this morning we're talking about his command that those who follow him be baptized. We're going to be in three passages that are very familiar, Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 28 and Mark 16. This is the third in our series, Do Whatever He Tells You, applying uh, Jesus' commands to our lives. Now we all know what tomorrow is. 246 years ago tomorrow, leaders from the 13 British colonies in America assembled as the Continental Congress in Philadelphia and signed what we now call the Declaration of Independence. Uh, We have been an independent lot ever since. But like those signers who separated themselves from the tyranny of England, we still need to see the importance and the, necessary, and the necessity of being dependent upon others, particularly of being dependent upon God. That was described for us in the last sentence of the Declaration of Independence. We're not independent from each other. We are not independent from God. But the writers said this before they signed their names. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, that is, God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Yes, they were declaring independence from a tyranny, but they were turning around and saying, we will be dependent upon God, and we will be dependent upon one another. And I am here to tell you this morning that 246 years later, we as Americans cannot walk away from that commitment that we are dependent upon God and upon each other. Likewise, we cannot walk away from the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this series about Bible commands, we are focusing on the instructions of Jesus. We talked about how many hundreds of Bible commands there are throughout all the scriptures, but within the four gospels, there are 100 commands of Jesus. And we have discovered that out of those 100 commands, there are seven themes. They can be grouped into seven major commands. Last week, we looked at Jesus calling us to faith and to repentance. And, he, and Mark tells us that that was what Jesus was commanding when he first started his preaching, faith and repentance. Today, we need to understand why it is so important to be baptized. And throughout the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, throughout the book of Acts, throughout the letters that we have, we have faith, repentance, and baptism always tied together. And so we need to understand that we're baptized for two reasons. Really, we could go into a lot of details, and we could spend a year talking about baptism if we wanted to, but when we boil it all down, we're baptized for two reasons. First, we're baptized because Jesus set the example. Look at Matthew chapter 3, and in Matthew chapter 3, we see Matthew telling us the story of John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for Jesus, the one who proclaimed that the Messiah was coming. Uh, Actually, John the Baptist, who was a relative of Jesus and is actually part of The Christmas story, if you read the Gospel of Luke, John the baptizer, he said this in Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill righteousness. And then John consented, which means John baptized Jesus. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Why are we baptized? Well, first of all, because Jesus set the example. Now, let's talk a little bit about what John was doing at the Jordan River. Why was he baptizing? Ceremonial washings prior to meeting for worship was commanded in the Old Testament. When Jewish people came together to worship, whether in the temple in Jerusalem or in their local synagogue, which would have been the local congregation in an outlying community, when they came together to worship, God had commands for them to ceremonially cleanse themselves, and it always involved water, and it always involved immersion. If there wasn't water near the synagogue, mikvahs were built adjacent to the synagogue. A mikvah, it's a tank. It's a water pool. I was privileged to be in Israel back in 1999, and we visited some of the excavated ruins of some of the ancient uh, synagogues in the area that Jesus ministered in, and without fail, there was a mikvah nearby. It looked a lot like that baptistry, steps going down into a, a, a hand-carved piece of rock filled with fresh water so that those coming to worship could dip themselves in it and then ceremonially be clean and ready to go into the synagogue. But John's baptism, it wasn't done in a mikvah. It wasn't done in conjunction with Sabbath worship. John's baptism was different. It took place on the banks of the Jordan River, and his ministry was to prepare people for the coming Messiah. And he baptized, just not to make people ceremonially clean, he baptized people unto repentance. He's saying, you need to change your heart. You need to change your life. You need to change everything about you. You need to repent and come to God and be prepared for what God's about to do when he sends his son. Now, the coming of Jesus was imminent because both John and Jesus were born months apart. And now, as Jesus was ready to begin his ministry, John's preaching became more intense. And he was winning more people to this view of suddenly there's a prophet after 400 years speaking publicly about God. Suddenly there's this promise that Messiah is not just coming, but he's on the cusp of arriving. And there was a lot of excitement, anticipation, enthusiasm, People were responding. They were repenting and they were committing themselves to God's will. They were allowing themselves to be baptized by John. And then a wrench was thrown into the works. That happened when Jesus showed up. And Jesus didn't just show up to say to, to John, John, thanks for everything you've been doing. I'll take it over from here. Uh, your work's finished. God bless you, my friend, my cousin. He didn't say that. What Jesus did is he came to John and he said, baptize me. And for John, that was inconceivable. You see, Jesus and John talked about it. In Matthew, their conversation took center stage. John already told others that he was not worthy to even untie or carry the sandals of the coming Messiah. He was there to proclaim his coming and to prepare people for him and to bring their hearts right and to have them respond in baptism. That's what John was doing. And now Jesus appeared and he says, baptize me, John. It just threw him for a loop. John protested. He said, Jesus, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You don't deserve or need to be baptized. You haven't sinned. Instead, 
shouldn't you be baptizing me, a sinner? And Jesus insisted. He insisted and then he imposed his authority as the son of God and he demanded to be baptized. He said, John, let it be so for now. Let's do this. And then he followed with this explanation. He said, we need to do this, John. I need to be baptized because it's proper for me to fulfill all righteousness. Now, four times earlier, in the uh, story that Matthew wrote about Jesus, during Jesus' birth and his youngest days, Matthew emphasized how the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth and his flight to Egypt and his return to Nazareth as a, as a baby all were there to fulfill what had been predicted. And that's what Jesus was saying. My allowing you to baptize me fulfills what God wills. And so we're going to do this, John. And so John consented. So we know why John was baptizing. We know that Jesus and John talked about it. John objected and Jesus put those objections to rest. And Jesus was baptized. And then we see it was God's turn to talk. John and Jesus discussed the issue. Jesus won out. And then we see when Jesus came up out of the water, a divine revelation occurred. The heavens parted. And the full trinity of God appeared. The Holy Spirit descended. Matthew and the others tell us he looked like a dove gently landing upon Jesus. The Father approved, speaking from heaven, declaring Jesus as his son and saying, I am really pleased that he did this. He didn't need to, but he did it. Because he needed to set the example. If Jesus, the perfect, sinless son of God, consented to baptism, and if his followers will not consent to baptism, there's a problem. Jesus did it to fulfill righteousness. It's also interesting to note that it was at this point that Jesus was empowered for his ministry. Rather than immediately begin preaching and healing, he went away and retreated for, for 40 days, fasting and praying and gaining his strength from God. So here's the point. Here's the point of Jesus' baptism and it's setting an example for us. If the sinless son of God did not need to repent and be baptized, but he did so in order to do what was right. If God the Father was pleased with his actions, if God the Holy Spirit met him in that water after he rose from it, why shouldn't we who are sinners, we who are in need of repentance, follow the command to be baptized into Christ? Why should we say, it's not necessary, I don't need to do it? No, we need to understand that Jesus set the example. But then we also need to understand that after Jesus set the example and after he died on the cross and after he arose from the grave, Jesus commanded us to be baptized as well. And for that, we have two very familiar passages. The first is Matthew chapter 28, spoken by Jesus after his resurrection. And in verses 18, let's start at verse 16 because this picks up to say uh, that... Uh, the uh, disciples of Jesus met with him again to follow uh, the will of Jesus. And it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, we don't have any other information about that. Who were the doubters? We know about Thomas. We talked about Thomas last week. But here we see some doubted. And yet Jesus spoke this command. He came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We also have Luke telling us, I'm sorry, Mark, uh, telling us the same commission. Uh, words are just a little bit different, but the command is the same. After Jesus' resurrection and before he ascended to heaven, 
in, in Mark chapter 16, we have the story of that resurrection. And then we have this, uh, uh, this teaching starting um, at verse 14, Mark 16, 14. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. This is the night of his resurrection. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had arisen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so we have this command from Jesus to those who were his followers to tell us who would be his followers to be baptized. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And if we love Jesus, we will also obey his command of baptism. In fact, when people commit their lives to Jesus Christ, baptism is one of the very first commands of Jesus to follow. It's what people need to do. It's commanded by Christ. And on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preached that first sermon on that first Sunday of the church. And he concluded his message by saying, Therefore, you need to know this. This same Jesus, whom you crucified, is now both Lord and Christ. And it says that those who were there for worship for Pentecost, hearing this message were stabbed in the heart. They were convicted, and they said to Peter and the others, what can we do about this? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I need to tell you this. A church that does not baptize believers is defying a direct command of Jesus Christ. And a believer who chooses not to be baptized is also disobeying Jesus. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commands. Now, Ray Fowler wrote the following. He said, here in these United States, the importance of baptism is sometimes watered down. Excuse the pun. But in other countries, people seem to have a greater understanding of the importance and the necessity of baptism. When Muslims in the Middle East are baptized into Christ, they are disowned by their families. Christian baptism is viewed as the ultimate betrayal of Islam, and those who are baptized as Christians are often considered dead to their family and to their friends. Or they could actually wind up dead because in some Muslim countries, Christian baptism of a Muslim is viewed as blasphemy and is punishable by death under the country's blasphemy laws. Now, despite these risks and these costs, believers, Muslims who convert to Jesus Christ, still choose to be baptized. Why? Because Jesus commands it. Because it is an essential part of Christian discipleship. If Jesus did it, if he commands it, if people today in this world are risking their lives and their relationships to obey that command, why do we sit on our hands and say, I don't know if I need to do that? Baptism demonstrates that we are believers in Jesus Christ because we are obeying his commands. John said so in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. He said, we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Now, I need to tell you this. That does not mean that we will suddenly become perfect when we're baptized into Christ. We're still going to stumble. We're still going to fall along the way. I was baptized when I was nine. As a nine-year-old kid, I didn't know most of the sin in the world. And I can guarantee you, I have sinned a whole lot more since I was nine than before I was nine. But I can also guarantee you this. I have a relationship 
a family relationship with God the Father, with Jesus the Son, with the Holy Spirit as my guide that helps me through the mistakes and the troubles and the blunders that I make. I'm family and I belong to him. That's the difference. We have identified with Christ. We have united with Christ and we belong to Christ. We will still stumble. We will still fall. But baptism is much like a wedding ceremony. It changes our relationship. It makes us part of the family. We have a loving father who helps us through our difficulties. We have a savior who first on the cross and now in our lives rescues us from our sins. And we have a counselor, the Holy Spirit, who continues to teach and to guide us in the ways of Jesus. So please understand this. When we talk about the need for baptism today, we do not need to clean up our lives before coming to Christ. Far too many people have told me over these years, I'll make a decision to be a Christian. I'll make a decision to be baptized when I get some things straightened out of my life, when I get rid of some of my problems. That's not what Jesus tells us to do. Instead, we come to him and he takes away our sins. He renews us. He changes us. It is a surrender not an accomplishment, not what we have done, not how we have cleaned up our own acts, but it is surrendering ourselves as we are and letting Jesus cleanse us from the inside out. We allow Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, and Jesus' resurrection, which are all symbolized in baptism when we're lowered into the water and brought up. We allow those things to cover us and we come just as we are. And we allow him to make us new. So please, please understand that we can never allow other people to lessen the significance of identifying with Jesus. We can never allow someone else to talk us out of meeting Jesus in, in baptism. Because he died for us and because he was buried for us and because he arose from the grave... Paul tells us in Romans 6 that we do the same thing in baptism. We die to our old life. We rise new creatures because of Jesus, because of what he's done, because of what he's accomplished, because of him coming and dwelling and living in us. Don't allow other people to lessen that significance. Don't be so doggone independent. Even if you're an independent American, don't be so doggone independent that you think Jesus' commands do not apply to you. They do. And his first major command was to believe and repent from the gospel of Mark. His second major command to us is to be baptized. We need his death. We need his burial. We need his resurrection to transform our lives. And we need to identify with him in water in the way he committed himself in the flesh. Just as I am, without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou bidst me Come to thee, O Lamb of God. I come just as I am. It was Philip in the book of Acts. I'm sorry, it wasn't Philip. Um, uh, it was Ananias in the book of Acts who in telling Saul of Tarsus about Jesus said this. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. <laughs> Baptism isn't something we do to save ourselves. Baptism is responding to what Jesus has done. It's responding to that commitment it is that act of identifying with the one who has saved us forever. And the invitation to accept Christ, to be baptized, to come just as you are and let him do the changing. That invitation 
is offered now. If you're outside of Christ, if you've been holding off on identifying with Christ, you don't need to today. We've actually got the baptistry water warm for you. It's ready to go. We have the Spirit of God who is prompting your heart. We have the Son of God who died for your sins. We have the Father God who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. I want you to be baptized. And if you haven't done it, no time like the present, just as you are. Come to him. Name him as Lord. Identify with him in death, burial, and resurrection. And know that you're going to live forever with Christ. And we invite you to do that. If you're already a baptized believer and you're saying, I want to be part of the First Church of Christ, I want to be a member here, we invite you to come forward and proclaim that as well. And you can do any of those things as we sing this song. During the song, you can come forward and meet me here. We'll find out what your need is and we'll show you what the scriptures say. Would you follow Jesus? Would you make that commitment, follow that command to be baptized? Let's stand together and let's let God change our hearts.